Now, thank you, Roundtable and Creative Professional Development Center, who supported the guided lighting industry. And we're here to support the skills, the knowledge, the motivation, and the resources of the children's media leaders. And I think you'll see very quickly why this morning's session is a perfect example of how we go about doing that. A few months ago, I heard Helen Lewinsky speak at about my new uh, the seven essential skills every child needs, at the Fred Rogers Center. The book wasn't even out yet, but I pre ordered it that night because just hearing Ellen talk about her findings, it was clear to me how they would be indispensable to all of you in understanding your target audience's needs and abilities. So even before the book arrived, I asked Ellen if she would speak to a gathering of children's media professionals, and I'm so glad that she agreed. Then I actually got the book, and from start to finish, I found that Ellen had laid a foundation that can underlie every type, every kind of children's media. All platforms, all target age groups, media designed primarily to educate, media designed to entertain. And what I love about the seven essential skills described in my domain is that they can be the primary focus of the program, or a website, or a game, or an app, or they can sit quietly underneath the surface. A TV series that's about literacy or about math can rest on surface on a grade structure that uh, fosters connect connection building. A game may have learning objectives rooted in science, but demand focus and self-control as a way to succeed in the game. A website that encourages young people to learn about other world cultures almost by definition requires perspective taking. And an animated superhero applies critical thinking save the world. A creative framework that's built on the seven skills actually can, may embed more fundamental and long-term learning than the older curriculum itself. Here's an example of how my new making is influenced by thinking. Uh, two weeks ago I was in London and I saw a promo for a new BBC uh, preschool program called Zigzillas. And the tagline of the program was something like, uh, the program helps your child explore about music and sound. Before reading the book, I would have focused on music and sound in that sentence. After reading Mind in the Baking, my mind immediately went to how do they help kids explore? I read Mind in the Baking while I was at the uh, International Children's TV Festival, Bridget S. And many of you know how much I love to show programs from that festival the uh, outstanding, the innovative, the unusual from all around the world to children, U.S. children's media experts. And I'm actually working right now on plans for a New York screen this fall. Um, but as a tangible example of how mind in the making has changed my thinking and how I look at kids to you, I wanted to give you a tiny taster of the uh, Pretty Best 2010 suitcase that is indexed to the seven essential skills. So we're going to run that video now. Thank you, Rose and Anthony. As you can see, I am back at the piano with me. <clears throat> Are you ready? Yeah, I'm ready. Ich 
Wenn ich dann wirklich was Gutes tun möchte, dann beschäftige ich mich mit ihr zum Beispiel die Luca, die mag Holz, die mag das jetzt anzufassen, weil es so unterschiedlich rau und glatt ist. Und deshalb gehe ich halt manchmal mit ihr durchs Haus und lasse sie an den Holzbeinen rumfummeln, damit sie halt das spürt und das gefällt ihr. Enjoy. 
joined a very select roster in my mind at least of must have books for children's media professionals. And both in importance, and now that I can think of it in alphabetical order, it is going to sit right next to the outstanding books by our moderator, Lisa Gersey. Her Into the Minds of Babes, How Screens Not Affects Children from Birth to Age Five, is a thorough, balanced, and supportive guide for parents, and us too, to the research on media and young children. Lisa is now the director of the Early Education Initiative at the New American Foundation. Into the Minds of Babes and Mind in the Making, you can see why we counted this morning's conversation as a meeting of the minds. And with that, I turn it over to Lisa Kersey and Ellen Galinsky. So, good morning, everybody. It's really um, it's a thrill to be here, and for, for many reasons. One of which is that uh, I really see Ellen as a, as a mentor in so many ways, and it was many years ago that I heard that she was working on this book. And I was just fascinated and wanted to get my hands on all the videos that she was collecting when she went from uh, developmental psychology lab to developmental psychology lab and everywhere in between. I, I, what's amazing about the book is it really provides a front seat to some of the most important and fascinating uh, experiments in child development over the past 30 to 50 years. And there is so much to learn just by being able to see those experiments uh, happen before your eyes. And so what's really interesting as well about this, and that, uh, I don't know, uh, we'll, we'll definitely be seeing some of the videos from it in this format, but the book is also available as a book, which I've never heard of before, a video book. And um, so which you can see on the iPad or, or online. Um, and it really kind of opens up the idea of, you know, really helping kind of readers engage in a new way with the content, and I think it also kind of makes it a much fresher experience to really kind of see what, what is happening in a, in a, in a, children's, in a child's mind. So um, I want to make sure we can make it a plus. I even think, given the audience here, the video component of the actual book is really a fascinating piece. Um, so so the, the, the book is really about you know, lessons that parents can take, um, policymakers, teachers can take from these experiments that have been done for over many years. And what often gets left out of that, as many of you in this room know, is that when we think about how children's learning is shaped by their environment, most people forget that media is part of children's environment. And there's so much that media producers, I, I think, as, as David had said earlier, can really um, take from this and understanding themselves as part of, of children's learning environment. So with that, I wanted to um, you know, just, just get um, to uh, head on to get started here by talking a little bit about why. Why did you get into this book? Tell us a, little, a bit about what made you decide to launch the project. At the Families and Work Institute, we had done a series of studies where we actually went out and asked young people about the issues that they were facing growing up. So many people study kids. Do it this number. Okay, close. Um, so many people study children and in work and family life they have done 30, 40 years of research on how boy parents affect children. But believe it or not, no one had ever asked children themselves about how they saw their employed mothers and fathers. And that was uh, a research project that I did and became a book about 10 years ago. Following that, uh, after Columbine, I did a study where I went out and asked young people about their, uh, how they felt about violence, violence in their lives. And, and in all of these studies, I asked children for one wish, for one wish uh, to change the thing that was bothering them, in, in this case, reduce violence in their lives. The findings were always so surprising. And so I was uh, did another uh, study then looking at how kids saw work in the future, what they expected from their jobs in the future, and was going to, the next obvious uh, study was going to be on children and learning. So I went out, went out around the country, uh, as I usually did to talk to children, read all the literature, but went out to talk to young people themselves before designing a national representative study. And uh, what happened in going out and talking to young people around the country, third through 12th grade, completely set me on uh, a 10-year detour. 
uh, I, when, I, when I started to talk to children about learning, the first thing I learned was that I couldn't ask them about learning. I had to ask them about not learning. And then, um, because I couldn't get them to answer about learning, um, and I could finally get them to answer about times when they didn't learn. And, and then I would ask them when I'm learning, I, uh, you know, why is learning important? And they talked about uh, that learning was important to get a job, uh, to go on to schools, to be able to buy stuff, and so I wouldn't be a bum on the street mm -hmm. um, or flipping burgers. And I think probably every American said, parent has said that to his or her children at least once. And it's, you know, I mean, those are all good reasons. But the thing that was lacking for me was any extrinsic connection, intrinsic connection to learning. So um, I pushed hard and pushed hard and, and uh, finally could get them to talk about that. But these findings echoed a study of 81,000 young people around the country. Um, this was done about school when they asked why they go to school. And most kids said that they go to school so they can go to college, you get a good reason. They go to school because it's the law, okay? They go to school to see their friends. Only 39% of young people um, in high school said that they go to school to learn. And um, the thing that was most compelling to me because we were filming these children, we had a video camera there, a video crew filming these children, and they were dead on arrival. I mean, it was like the worst film you have ever seen. I knew I was never going to be able to show this one. Yeah. Like that flat face is no fire in their eyes. Well, I only had to contrast that with babies, um, infants, toddlers, preschoolers, and you think about them and learning, and you can't stop them from learning. They are trying to talk, they keep talking, 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 talking. They ask why questions forever if they're trying to learn to stand up. They fall down, they stand up, they fall down. You just can't stop them. And the fire in their eyes is burning brightly. And so um, I said to myself, what have you done to turn that fire off in children's eyes? That's what led me on this journey. So um, it was obvious to me that what I needed to do was to go out and look at the very best research on children and learning to better understand learning. Uh, in order to figure out how to keep that fire going in children's eyes or how to uh, re reignite it if, it if it has stalled or, or dim. And, uh, and I also wanted to film the research because I knew from talking to parents and teachers that reading academic studies is not always fun and even hearing about them verbally is not always fun. So actually uh, doing what my daughter calls is unlocking the, the doors of academia uh, with a video camera taking you into the labs themselves to show not only who the researchers are, but what they've learned and how they've learned it was the best going to be the best way to communicate. So uh, 10 years later and uh, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and thousands of hours of film, here we are. <laughs> so I, I know we're going to get into some of those uh, the seven skills, but you wanted to maybe start us off with one of those videos. Well, actually, I wanted to tell you two things that I learned. Um, the first was that underlying um, the seven skills. The first thing was that babies are born with incredible capacities. Their brains are wired to understand information in ways that I don't think we understood, you know, five years ago, ten years ago, who are continuing to understand. For example, uh, this is the research of Jenny Saffron, but they have a language sense. In other words, they have almost a statistical ability in their brains to hear. Uh, which sounds in their native language or what languages they're capable of doing this in more than one language go together. And, uh, and so that if they hear those sounds again and again and again, they can begin to pick out the beginnings and ends of the words in a sea of sound. I mean, how many of you have been to a country where you didn't understand what was being said and you know how strange you're surrounded by sound and you have, you know, you're looking for any word that sounds like something that you know. Um, and that must be what it's like to be a baby, but they have this ability to begin to hear sounds that go together. And they can detect this because in research, they, uh, they, uh, a child is always drawn to something new, uh, or typically drawn to something new. We'll see an example where it, it, that's not the case. Uh, later on, I've got a video of that. But, um, so you have children listen to a made-up language again and again and again and again until they get good and bored, and then you either give them the same combination of sounds in the made-up language or new sounds, and you see which they're drawn to, and they're drawn to the new sounds, not the same combinations of sounds. So they've been 
able to recognize to learn those sounds. They have the ability to understand large and small numbers of things, uh, approximate numbers, the research of Liz Belke at Harvard, and they have the ability to understand uh, people. They have what I call, I call this a number sense, a people sense, a language sense, an object sense, but they also have a people sense where they see people's behavior as intentional. They don't see people's behavior as random movements through space. Um, and they also differentiate, even in infancy, before they can talk, between uh, who's helpful and who's not. If you think about that, that's a very important thing for them to know. So I'm going to show you the first video. This is uh, at Yale and Karen Wynn's lab with a graduate student named Kylie Hammond. It's Helpers and Hitters. Babies are born with amazing capacities. At six months old and even younger, they can detect the difference between large and small numbers of things. And they can tell the difference between who's helpful and who's not. The way we addressed this question was uh, to show the baby these similar scenes of a robot trying to get out of the hill. Sometimes the red circle is held up the hill by a blue square. And when it reaches the top, it dances with joy. Yes. Then the infants see the circle try to get up the hill again. Only this time, there's a new player. When the circle works its way up, the triangle bumps it back down. The researchers then test how these nine-month-old infants interpret what they've just seen. An experiment who did not see um, which character is which brings over the two characters to the babies and just sees which character the baby touches first. Which one do you want it? But we found that, impressively actually, almost 100% of babies in a number of different uh, mm -hmm. studies prefer the more positive character. Who do you want? They seem to have an attraction to helpful pro-social individuals and also a real aversion to antisocial, unhelpful individuals. So already by the first year of life, they are making judgments about what is in the mind of another individual. Well, that, that gives you a sense of uh, children's amazing capacities, and if you are thinking, well, obviously they probably like um, squares better than triangles, uh, they vary those. Um, or you're thinking, well, they like blue or yellow better, they vary that. Um, nothing mattered except for when they took the eyes off the characters. When there weren't those googly eyes, the kids could care less uh, about the story. So they're connecting almost as if they were, these people were characters, which I think is uh, interesting. The second thing that I learned, sorry, is it put googly eyes on everything? Googly eyes, googly eyes. Um, the second thing that uh, that I think is important is that uh, because I have done work for years with employers, and I've heard employers complain so often about the fact that uh, new entrants to the workforce aren't coming in with the skills we need, blah 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 blah. You know, and, you know since Aristotle, people have been complaining about. So you might say that that's normal, but um, but they were really talking about very specific skills that we that, that they know that people need to thrive in, and they're a different technological, fast-moving global world. And uh, I began to see the skill, and I've done three or four studies of employers and employees looking at what they thought was most important. I began to see these skills emerge in children, but they. Uh, they uh, emerge, but they then they don't just automatically develop. They have to be promoted, and we're not paying any attention to them. We're not promoting them. I mean, I really do think that there's almost a crisis in the sense of these are capacities that are um, as important as children's learning content, but we're not paying any attention to them, and um, and they're easy to promote in everyday ways. 
one thing that I realized uh, right away is I began to figure out which were the skills that research shows help children now and help children in the future was that they were all uh, all based in one way or another in the prefrontal cortex of the brain and they all involve what researchers call executive function. That is, they involve the capacity to, um, to focus and pay attention, to remember the rules, um, more than one rule at once, to think flexibly, and to resist the temptation to go on automatic, um, but in order to pursue a goal. And um, I brought a video that just shows you an example. This is Adele Diamond um, and her day and night experiment that shows how these skills emerge, but how we have to and how they involve those four capacities. A child is shown a picture of the sun and asked to say night. And when shown a picture of the moon, he should say day or morning. What do you say when you see this? Day. Yes. What do you say when you see this? Yes. The little boy is going up automatic and making the stance. He was rushing himself. He wasn't taking the time he needed. But giving him time to stop and think helps. So what I did was to sing this little bit. Think about the answer. Don't tell me. You might think that it's interference, but instead gives him the time to figure out the answer. Now can you tell me what he said? <laughs> Think about the answer. Don't tell me. Now. <laughs> so if you think that's easy, just try this little experiment with me. Take your foot and turn it clockwise. I know that if you're behind a chair, it's not going to work. Try. Got it? Keep doing that. Okay, take, take your hand, your right hand, and make it under six. Okay, so that is, that's not going on automatic. You can learn to do that, but that's the ability to remember the rule, to focus, Think flexibly and to uh, and to resist the temptation of going on automatic in order to achieve a goal. Executive functions are always goal directed. And then you make a point of calling these life skills. Uh, and that have been, you know, different folks have different terms for this, this kind of of learning. Uh, I, I was going to note many probably seen the the Newsweek article this week on creativity, crisis of creativity. Uh, since it, maybe there are some creative skills that can be taught and promoted if only you're giving kids the environments to do so. There's also a lot of new uh, work coming out from the uh, economist Jim Heckman at the University of Chicago that's looking at what he calls soft skills and how those have been have underplayed and need to be and, uh, more emphasized. So it seems that this is very much in, in line with, with a lot of that, that new kind of trend of thinking of it's not just about kids being able to recite their ABCs, we're talking about something much deeper here that, that children need that we should be promoting um, and helping them to develop. But I want to start maybe by taking um, a, perhaps a little bit of a double advocate position as it relates to media and, and some of these skills. So it, you know, we have seven of them. Let me just list them quickly um, for those who don't have a book in front of them. There's focus and self-control, perspective taking, communicating, making connections, critical thinking, taking on challenges, and self-directed engaged learning. But surely we actually can't play a role in, in all of that. What I wonder is, are there some of these skills that are better learned outside of media? Uh, and, and, and this is a way to kind of get into some of the perspective taking. Uh, research that, that you highlight where children need to be able to understand that um, that someone else might be thinking something a little bit differently than they are that they you know, this, some of you out there in development psychology may know his theory of mind um, the idea that 
uh, it takes a while for children to develop to the point where they can understand that someone's maybe trying to persuade them of something else because they have a different idea in their mind than someone else. Um, that, and just a quick little anecdote. Sometimes I talk about how my, when my kids were, say, three years old and grandma would call, they would get on the phone and they would say, hey, grandma, and they'd say, oh, you know, what tell what you did today. And they'd say, you know, she, uh, you know, Gigi came up a really pretty picture today, and then Gigi, she, my, my daughter would hold up the picture to the phone, like, and see grandma, see my picture, just not even imagining that her grandmother's going to see that picture, you know? Of course grandma can see it, because she, she's seen what I'm seeing. Um, but, to, but can we kind of go down this road a little bit? Tell me about perspective taking, and if you see whether there's any correlation to media and maybe how children develop as they grow up. Uh, yes, I'm, I'm happy to. First, uh, the reason that I uh, shook my head about soft skills is that I think that these are uh, very essential hard skills. Uh, they take place in the part of the brain that is the most sophisticated. It brings together, together our social, emotional, and cognitive uh, kinds of functioning. And I call them life skills because they help children now. Uh, my criteria for picking a skill had to do with helping kids now uh, and helping them later. So that there's a lot of research in the book that shows how they how these skills help kids uh, thrive now and, and, and in the future. And if you think about it, in, in the world that we live in, it's really imperative for all of us to know that uh, that different people have different likes, dislikes, thoughts, beliefs, and so forth. I remember hearing uh, Bill Clinton when he was president talk about that most fundamental challenge in the global world is to understand the perspectives of people are different from you. And I hear that from business leaders all of the time. But uh, you ask uh, how it develops and what's the role of media. And the first uh, uh, experiment that Alison Gottlieb did with 14-month-olds was she gave kids a bowl of uh, broccoli, raw broccoli, and a bowl of goldfish crackers. I mean, some of you know this experiment. Yeah, and then um, and then she says um, she pastes one over the other and makes a face. Ooh, goldfish crackers! I don't like them. Uh, mm, yum, broccoli. The kids tend to be eating the goldfish crackers and looking at the broccoli. A little bit of this thing. And then she will say, "Give me what I like." And a 14-month-old, on average, will give her what they like. They'll give her the goldfish crackers, mm -hmm. but a an uh, even an 18 month old, just in those four months, uh, there's a little child named Nathan we filmed, and it's in the book. Uh, you know, takes a piece of rock like this. I <laughs> like that, but he has a She's a strange person. She likes to rock like that. Okay, I'll give it to her. Um, and then that begins, continues to develop that they can tell that different people have different likes and dislikes, but even at three, it's a little harder for them to understand that people can think different thoughts, and those are done through a series of experiments called mistaken belief uh, experiments. And I did bring one to show you. Uh, should, we, should we take a look at it? We'll about paper clips and crayons and mm -hmm. shows how this develops. We devised an experiment to try and test when could children understand that someone else might think something they went from the same thing to say. But what we did was to take a closed up box, like a crayon box, and fill it with something that was not crayons, like paper clips. So, you see this box? Okay. And what do you think is inside this box? Crayons. What we do is we trick the children. So we show them a crayon box, and the children at first think they were crayons. And then we open up the box and it turns out they're really hip for us and This is how it goes. Paper clips. Okay. And then we turn the questions. And then we would ask the children some simple questions like, what did you think was inside this box when you first saw it? And what would someone else think was inside this box? We're asking them to take the perspective of another person who doesn't have that knowledge, who just sees the closed crayon box. And what we discover when we do that is with the three-year-olds, think that everyone will have the same belief that they do. Suppose Alex comes in and he sees this box all closed up like this. What will Alex think? Will he think there are crayons in the box or paper clips? He'll think there are paper clips in the box. So what do you think 
you first saw this box all closed up like this? Did you think there were crayons inside, or did you think there were paper clips inside? Shock. There was paper clips inside. But by the time children were four, they did understand this. Now, when you first saw this box like this, all closed up like this, what did you think was this like it? fundamental to school success, understanding what the 
teachers expect, for example, you can't be successful in school unless you know what a teacher expects. So being able to see beyond yourself and understand that someone else may expect different things is, is uh, just essential. And the use of, of that book, that, I mean, obviously, that's telling the story in the same way any, any program or uh, even an online game can, can, can tell a story. It seems that what's really important there as well is that contextual experience around it. And it would be interesting to think about how that could be embedded into the unit. That, that moment when a parent or a teacher says, what do you think is going on in this character set? You know, what do you think is happening there? So I, I see that there could be some kind of places where that can, can very much inform what um, media producers are working on. I, just as a side note, the other reason that the perspective taking is interesting to me is because um, from the point of view of those who worry about advertising directed at, at kids, um, there's often the argument made that it's not fair to advertise to kids until they can understand that someone's trying to persuade them to buy a product, until they can have that and have enough of those critical thinking skills to get to one of these other life skills. Um, to be able to say, hey, wait, they just want me to buy this product because. And what I think is really interesting, though, about the experience that you talk about is we're talking about younger children that is commonly noted when the advertising debate comes up. So if we're talking about some change happening between three and four years of age, five years of age, um, that's different than the seven or eight years of age that we have often been hearing about um, when it comes to being kind of what's, what's fair. And I, I just think that's, I mean, that's maybe kind of provocative in terms of how young can kids start understanding advertising and at what point does it mean that media literacy actually has a, a larger role to play there. When my kids were little, we had um, a game called Break That Egg. Mm -hmm. um, what do you think they're trying to sell you? How do you think they're trying to sell it to you? Does it, is it effective? Mm -hmm. Okay, break that ad, and uh, it got my kids to realize that if they were trying to sell them, you know, we think it's fair to just sell girls girly stuff, and you know, our kids would get into really good discussions about that. I don't know that all parents have time to or um, want to do that, but it was a very effective way of, uh, of helping my children look at television as, as uh, consumers. Right. Let's, let's talk for a second about another one of the skills, communicating. Um, you bring in a lot of the research that's been done on parentees on the, um, and how important it is to have that kind of special language between the parents and, and children and, and how much gesture matters and even where parents look, how much that matters. Um, so tell me where you see, is there a significance there for, for media? For, for young children, the way that we naturally talk to children or even dogs, um, he, I talk about <laughs> Oh, she's uh, gotten very good at pointing. Um, <laughs> and I had to experiment with her when I was writing this book. I taught her to point for what she wants. Um, she was doing it. Really. <laughs> uh, she picked last night, she picked up uh, and asked her whether she wanted a cracker or a corn chip. She pointed to the one she wanted. She picked it up.
18 month olds are brought into a lab with a parent. On the screen, they see pictures of two familiar objects, and hear a sentence with the name of one of them. Where's the baby? Can you see it? Very young children who may only speak uh, uh, you know, a handful of words are quickly getting their little eyes to the right place so that they're looking at the picture that goes with the sound they're hearing. Which one's the truck? During the experiment, Dr. Fernald films the child and then measures the time it takes for the child's eyes to turn to the picture that's named. And what you see is that at 15 months, you hear, where's the baby? And sometime after the uh, speech is over, the child shifts from the dog into the baby. At 18 months, the shift is quicker. They're there by the end of the world. By 24 months, uh, that's just nine months later, all they need to hear is, where's the baby? And they're out of there. Which one's the shirt? We also notice that children differ in this ability. Some children are quite a bit faster, and other children are somewhat slower. If you're slower to pick up new words, you can't use those new words to help you learn still more new words. So having a, an advantage in, in speed of learning has what we call cascading effects. Well, it is a different kind of it's a Why? Yeah. That's an ostrich. Those children who are faster and more efficient at, at interpreting speech at 18 months are also likely to be doing slightly better uh, at the age of four or five years on standard tests of readiness for school and, and cognitive uh, level, that sort of thing. How families talk to children makes a big difference. The experience of hearing a lot of language and rich and diverse language not only provides you with models to learn from, it actually affects the efficiency with which you learn. There's um, a number of things that you can do can make a big difference for young children. Um, that they'll start to pick up what that word means if it's at the end of the sentence. Uh, so, you know, like, it. yeah, there's the baby. It's easier for them to understand baby than the baby's wearing a diaper, and they may not pick out the word baby in, in that way. And I think that that's, um, that would be very interesting um, as we kind of think about what makes sense, um, both in media for, for parents to help them kind of figure out who how to make sure that they're not not to overly formulate a parent's language with their children, but just to help them understand um, what's going to be you know, the easiest way to interact with, interact with their children and to get um, that reaction uh, from them. But also, if, if we get to a place where you know, there's more media that hopefully with a lot of co-viewing is directed at infants, that there's at least an understanding that that. Uh, we're going to have to be really careful about the way language is used, the way gestures and pointing, um, and all of these pieces are used so that the, the children really are starting to kind of grasp what's being shown. It, it's the inner, it's the responsiveness. I mean, I know that television um, is getting more responsive, where they're asking kids uh, to respond, not just to look. As you know, it's moving away from the empty vessel, pouring knowledge in to the to the child as the active uh, learner view, which I think is happening in education. I was at the Aspen Institute Ideas Festival last week and, and looking at a lot of uh, uh, education reform. I have a couple of posts blog about it that uh, we just put up yesterday. And so much of, of the, the transformational ideas in education are, are, uh, are project-based, but asking children to have a passion and something that they pursue and then that give and take. So I think it's always that give and take, that responsiveness where someone asks you a question, asks you to think further about something, uh, comments on what you've said. Um, and and uh, you can do that, obviously, in television and, and, uh, and games and that sort of thing. But that really is what promotes both language development, but also the ability to communicate. Communicating is more than language development. Communicating, to me, is um, understanding how what you say is going to be heard. Uh, I know that uh, people get master's and doctoral degrees in that in the whole issue of strategic communication as the basis of advertising. How do, how do you know that you're going to be heard, particularly if people's perspectives are different than yours and that's ultimately what you want. But um, I've seen some really good teaching that way where children will read stories that they've written and then get people to 
say how they felt about the stories that they heard that the children had written as a way of getting feedback on their own communication. And there's a couple things here. One, I wanted to at some point try to get to the engagement and curiosity piece, but I might skip that for me because you mentioned gaming and feedback. And I think so, and we want to make sure we have time for a of questions as well. And there are a lot of places in where I found some insights that, that might be useful when we think about the more immersive or interactive environments for young kids. So, uh, first of all, the, the communication piece, the fact that, that, that having that social conversation and back and forth, we know more and more the research is showing that how important that is for children's learning. Is there a place um, in, whether it's in Skype-like you know, chats that, that, that kids can have online, that they can get that. There's also the, um, the ability for children to know that they have an audience, right? And so, and there's a point in, in the book where you talk about how children may um, be, be better at remembering what they're learning when they have to describe it to somebody else, when they have to kind of recreate what they learned or figure, you know, talk about how they solved their problem. If they have a, a big audience, you know, that they can tell this whole story to, it can be even more powerful. And I, I myself, you know, start thinking about you know, watching my kids um, on, you know, say, one of the uh, PBS websites where they can look at videos that other children have uploaded and see these kids explaining, you know, to Buster what their hometown is like or something like that. This, these are moments that really seem to be lighting a, a fire in there. I like, oh, I can describe this. Where's the video camera, Mom? You know. Um, so do you mind just extrapolating on that a little bit, what that means and, and how that is? I think it was a memory chapter that you were talking about. Yeah, I did a lot of looking at memory because memory, as we know, is the center of the cognitive universe. You can't learn anything. This is that, that's the statement of Patricia Bauer from Emory University, and I just love that statement. But you can't learn anything unless you remember it. So what helps us remember? And, and what helps us remember is uh, having repeated experiences, having first-hand experiences, and uh, this is the research of, uh, th that's the research of Patricia Bauer and Robin Kladish, but um, there's also some really wonderful studies that we've just been down to video them about, uh, about three weeks ago. Uh, happened to be oh, so there. There. We were young, yeah. no, we, we videotaped uh, Bethany Real Johnson's uh, studies where she's given kids the kind of test that they would get Standardized kind of math uh, pattern tests, and then um, and then given them different conditions to see uh, under which condition do they remember them, and they remember them best if they've had to tell someone about them. And it's actually why play matters too. Play, you're synthesizing and recreating an experience. So it's the same sort of principle we remember when we can, when we have to incorporate it and make it uh, our. Uh, I know I'm that way too. If I just read something, I might not remember it, but if I'm taking notes on it, I might remember it better. Right. If I'm having to explain it to someone right away, then I'll probably remember it even better. Uh, her, her closing line, Bethany Johnson's closing line, her study is, if you want a child to remember something, you have to tell it to his or her mom or dad. So, yeah. Yeah. I think another point that you, in terms of getting feedback, though, uh, that you, um, you and I talked about a lot is, is how you praise children. Yes, yeah, so Carol Dweck's research is a big a part of one of the chapters of this book. And um, so, yeah, tell us a little bit about I have it on video, but I think just to get to questions, I won't show it. But uh, what she's found is she was interested. Her, her question has been who are the kids who will take on the hard problem? That's been her life work. So, if you give kids a series of problems and then you give them a choice, would you like an easy problem or or a hard problem, or you like a problem where um, you'll get the right answer and, um, and it won't be hard for you, or you'll struggle but you might learn something. And she's been interested in seeing what differentiates those two uh, groups of uh, children. Uh, this is in uh, the skill in, my, in uh, undertaking on challenges, because I think we do need kids who will get back on that, what my mother would call it, get back on the course when you fall off. You know, who are the people who don't take failure, you know, uh, where the comeback is. Um, and she found that, uh, among other, that the mindset of the children 
is critically important. The kids who have a growth mindset, that they understand that you continue to learn and grow. In fact, she's done some work in teaching kids about their own brains and how they're forming synapses when they're learning new things and they can see that the brain is, uh, is a, a work in progress. Uh, they're more likely to have a growth mindset. The kids who have a fixed mindset, that is you're born smart, you're born beautiful, you're born athletic, you're born this or that, you can't really do too much about it, um, are the, the kids who will, who will retreat into safety. But the way that we praise kids makes a big difference. If we praise kids for their personalities, for their intelligence, for their attributes, they will be less likely to take on a challenge. And I've got it on, on video where even just right there and then, uh, some kids are told, wow, you did, you did really well on that puzzle. You must be really smart. And then you give them the choice, I'll take the easier puzzle. <laughs> or you say to them, wow, you know, you, you did well on that puzzle. Uh, you worked really hard on it. And you figured out which pieces to put together. They'll take the next part of puzzle. And you can just change kids' behavior like that. So the kind of phrase that, that focuses on effort or strategy will get kids to uh, get back on that horse when they fall off. So I'm just thinking about in terms of software that provides feedback to, to children when they've gotten something right. It's, it's now one of these things where I'm starting to cringe whenever I'll see, and actually Warren Buckley and Mr. Church got me on this too, but I'll start to cringe whenever it's like, you're so smart, you got it right. And I'm like, don't say that, <laughs> don't tell them that. It would maybe be far better to say, uh, you work hard, or I see that you, you know, who knows what, right? Or maybe no feedback at all, just to keep them going. Uh, oh, it's like feedback. I think specific feedback, uh, uh, very specific to what they've done. I know uh, that uh, as I was sharing this research with some of the grown-up kids uh, in my neighborhood, some of the kids who grew up with my children, uh, <laughs> they talked about how they felt that they're, you know, they grew up in the self-esteem era where you're, you're so beautiful, you're so smart, you're the best kid in the world. And it always made them feel like their parents were like delusional. <laughs> and, uh, so I think it's uh, <laughs> self that didn't exactly produce what we wanted. Yeah. 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 More specific yeah. phrase yeah. really is what's important. Yeah. Well, let's go to your last video about yeah. the marshmallows. Just to kind of close out, and then there's a, I'm sure there's a million questions out there. As many of you know, the there are marshmallows on the cover of this book, and we need to find out why. As my fellowship with them there. And they're all multicolored. Which I agree with them. He was right. <laughs> so, yeah, do you, do you mind setting it up and telling yeah. us a little bit about why? Yeah, the marshmallow test, probably a number of you have seen it. Um, and uh, we, have, we have, I think, the best video of it. Uh, if you've seen some of the other videos uh, of the marshmallow test. So I'll just, uh, I'll show it to you. Let's just take a look at the marshmallow test. Under the skill of focus and self-control. Can anyone saw that New Yorker article a while back? Yes. Probably. And ours are, our videos are on our website, so you're welcome to go to them. This is not bad, okay? It's called the marshmallow test. We try to set up situations in which young children make a choice between two or something that you prefer later or one or something that you prefer less now. If you had to choose, would you like to have one marshmallow or would you like to have two marshmallows? The whole point of the experiment is to set up an intense conflict between the two. Now here's how we play this game. I'm going to leave the room. While I'm gone, if you can stay here and wait for me to come back without eating the marshmallows, then you get two marshmallows. But if you don't want to wait, you can make me come back right away. <laughs> <laughs> but then you get one marshmallow, not two marshmallows. I'm okay. You don't ring the bell? Okay. The concept of the child is very heavy. Is that about half will go one way and half will go the other? <laughs> it's like a little window in the world for the limits that everybody faces. <laughs> a very simple and direct way of measuring the confidence that seems to make an important. 
longer they were able to wait at age four. The better the ratings of their ability to control themselves and to pursue their academic and other goals. Kids are able to delay gratification are increasingly learning ways of managing ways of managing distress. In middle life, there's less drug use, higher educational level attainment, much less uh, to have lower self-esteem, uh, to engage in bullying behavior with other people. The correlations are clearly statistically significant. But that in no way means that the monster who was before didn't wait a long time is in any way doomed. Or, or you know, uh, held in, in, in that 
sort of way. Uh, she just looked at how they comfort themselves and help the families and the nurses um, and the doctors uh, follow the child's lead and have pretty astounding results. Hi, I'm Cynthia, and um, my background is both in helping other people create content that goes out in the video and entertain the lawyer, as well as I also create content for parents. And I'm also a mom of two young children, and I haven't yet dove into the book, but I came, came across tonight about Alice. And one of the things that I find fascinating in my conversations with parents, and I think it's just a little bit coincidental that there's a principal's meeting you know, over in the other building here today. There's a whole big conference. And what I find is that parents want to do so much for their children. We all want what's best for our children. And I get stuck with this also with my own children is that we don't know how to go about it. There's, there's more to just being an unconditional, loving parent that you need the steps in, in knowing how they are developing. And so what is your, and I'd love to talk to you further just in general, but what is your best advice for parents besides to read your book, but in terms of the takeaways that we can implement daily with our children? Uh, well, that's hard for me to do with, with one piece of advice. Um, with the specific issue, I'm, I'm sure I have very specific things to say. Because in each chapter, what I have is, um, let, let's say a, a, a chapter is half the research which I try to tell in the way that you've seen it. I try to tell it very visually, and then with a book you can actually see it. But then I have pages, as many pages as I have describing what we know about how kids develop um, these skills that will help them thrive. I have suggestions, hundreds of suggestions for babies, for toddlers, for, for preschoolers, and for older children. So, if, so for every for every issue there, there's just lots and lots of how-tos that I hope are helpful. And I was pretty careful to make sure that the how-tos came very directly from the research. For example, with perspective taking, uh, Ross Thompson, Alice, uh, Alison Gottnick have experimented with how best to help children learn to take perspectives. So the way, that, like Ross Thompson found that parents who would read a story to their children and read it just, just the facts, ma'am, uh, you know, just straight through, okay, we're supposed to read, we're reading, okay, we've we read, versus having a conversation, versus elaborating on it, those children were better at taking the perspectives of other, other children. So that they're very specific research-based suggestions. But if I could give one piece of advice to parents, it would be the lemonade stand. Um, I kind of thought there would be a lemonade stand on the cover, but, <laughs> but no, my, my publisher was right to <laughs> seven of them do. Um, the reason that I say that is that um, the lemonade stand comes from my own daughter, Laura, who, um, when she was about five or six, with her friend, friends Katie and Alana, had a lemonade stand in our neighborhood. And they, um, they were really hard on their lemonade stand. They, we didn't let them use frozen lemonade, so they had to go to the store. They had to figure out how many lemons to buy. They had to figure out how much water to put, not too much sugar. You were telling me about too sweet lemon, or maybe Miss Kelly told me about too sweet lemonade. Um, they had to um, figure out how much they would charge for it versus what they spent so that they could make a profit. They'd have to figure out how much of their profits from the week before they'd invest into the, you know, back into the business the next weekend. Um, they had to figure out what kind of signs got people to actually stop and buy their lemonades or whether they were aggressive or whether they sat there and, you know, they, they figured out marketing, had to figure out how to best market it. And if you think about all the lessons for a five or six year old who probably can't sit still otherwise, but there she sat by the lemonade stand all day long and thought about lemonades, uh, you know, all weekend. And she moved into other things, so she should have begun lemonade stands, obviously. And not every child should have a lemonade stand, but I think that the message to parents would be whatever your child is interested in, um, help your child get deeper and deeper and deeper into it. Help them pursue it. Help them continue to to uh, to uh, to learn about it. That's the way. You, uh, if if I started with my concern about the fire not being in children's eyes, uh, when children have something that they're caring about, wanting to learn about, wanting to do, then the fire is in their eyes, even if it's been out for a while. And uh, I was struck last week at the Aspen Institute 
when I, uh, there was a whole track on education and, and uh, uh, reforms in education or transformations in education. But the schools that were actually having kids succeed in the tests better, on the regular academic tests better, were the ones that were project oriented and that built on the ch children's interests. Uh, so there was a school in, in uh, Cleveland, for example, uh, called MC3, that's where the kids uh, pick projects of their own choosing and then work on them for a long time. Or I described in the book, a school in Tennessee, where the kids, uh, where they partner with museums and the kids create museum exhibits uh, as a part of their learning. Uh, or Poe Bronson in the Newsly cover story describes uh, a school where the kids had to figure out how to block the sound from, from a window. Um, so it's these, these programs, I think, we're moving, hopefully, hopefully we're moving in education to being able to help children learn the things, the content, and the skills that they need to learn but by building on their own passions and interests. And it doesn't need to go further than, like, my son was passionate about Superman, and I was pretty sick of Superman mm -hmm. um, and Batman and all of those guys, you know, that were running around in house and costume all day long. And um, we got him interested in knights of old. You know, we said, well, Superman's probably interested in knights. And then we were reading him stories of King Arthur. And, you know, we could, you know, he moved uh, into music. Uh, he always was interested in music. We could always pursue that. But my son now is, is a musician. Uh, and my daughter was always interested in women and girls uh, in her, in school. And every time she had a paper to write or a project to do, it was about women and girls and whatever culture she was studying. And now she, she is uh, funding uh, projects all. She's a, a social, uh, fun social entrepreneurial projects around the world, tackling the world's toughest problems, and is writing her second book. So she, you know, both of my kids, I think if there was anything I did really smart as a parent was to help them follow their passions. I can't wait to do the marshmallow test. I would have been all three. Thank you. Two of the things you mentioned, uh, um, yeah. one was um, the impact of the audience on learning behavior uh -huh. and also perspective taking. Mm -hmm. uh, both of those have uh, impact something I'm interested in right now, which is bullying. And I was wondering, do you see anything about the um, impact of being able to take perspective affecting bullying behaviors later on or even at all? The, the question is, uh, well, do you think that role, learning, the relationship between bullying and perspective being able to see the perspective of somebody else? Yeah. Um, well, I think Larry Aber's study, the one that I showed you, uh, was trying to address the issue of bullying in, in a classroom. And he found that years of trying to teach problem solving to kids, we use words, we don't use, you know, blah, 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 you know, all that stuff that we do. Or you've got problems. Um, you two both want this toy, how will you solve it? Uh, that didn't work very well by itself without helping uh, the children learn to take each other's perspectives. So let, let's take a, a, a classroom of kids and they're having a fight. Um, you can have them, you can use problem solving, having them brain, brainstorm a number of solutions uh, for uh, solving the problem, but then say, well, how would, how do you think that um, Eric would react to that solution. How do you think um, Veronica would react to that solution? How do you think that Amanda would react to that solution? How do you think that uh, Luann would react to that solution? So you help them think about what they want to do and then understand the perspectives of others. And that's what they did in this curriculum and found that violence was reduced particularly and test scores came up particularly among the kids who um, had had the biggest conflict problems. So I do see a very direct relationship between bullying and perspective taking. You have to teach perspective taking. Um, Larry Eber calls it, the kids who are more likely to bully had a hostile attribution bias. That, those are his um, researchy words. But what he means by that is that they saw other people out to dish you, out to get you, out to, you know, when it wasn't really necessarily true. Is it, is it ever too late to um, start teaching? No. No, no. I mean, I think the point that I mean, it's obviously easier if we teach kids younger. I mean, 
development is, you know, you're building on, it's like building on a house, you know, you're starting in the basement and building up. But it's never too late to teach these skills. It's never too late to teach any of these skills. And I think that's the point, you know, there were a couple of points that I wanted to make um, that I learned from doing this. One is that any child can learn these skills, two, any adult can teach them, three, it's never too late, and four, it doesn't necessarily require expensive equipment or toys. They're everyday things that you can do to uh, promote these skills. As I said, I did a study on youth and violence, and uh, I asked children if they could have one wish to reduce the violence in their life, what would that wish be? And they said, stop the teasing, stop the picking on. And I was, uh, we've had so much debate about social media um, in this country and how kids are using uh, social media to, you know, the, to wham bang each other and then all day long the principals are dealing with who was even him on Facebook the night before and so forth. And one principal out a lot of, in New Jersey got a lot of attention for just absolutely just saying that, that the kids, that the parents should outlaw and he was outlawing at the school. And I think that that's ridiculous. I think the kids are going to do it anyway. Um, um, I think that you teach children to use it responsibly. But what I would do and, um, is what came out of the kid's wish. I would have a meeting in the school, and I've, and I've done this in schools when my study came out. Go to the school, none of the kids like it, but they all think that they have to do it because otherwise someone will get them. So if you sort of, if you can say, people don't really like this, and then let's, let's figure out what we're gonna do if people start to act this way. Let's create a code of conduct that we'll, code of conduct that we'll all stick with. And then let's do a media campaign about how to reduce this, the, the, the uh, you know, the social media violence, uh, the, the cyberbullying that we see. Uh, that's how I would handle that if I were running a school, frankly. And I've done it in schools and seen, seen the results. Yes, go ahead. I'm Tom Belcher. I have a seven-year-old who just finished first grade. And uh, I was very impressed by the way you cringed at the term soft skills. <laughs> and uh, most of us said... Well, you're going to watch this. <laughs> well, you know, also that because it sets up a hierarchy of there are then hard skills and the important, important stuff, right? And uh, 30 years ago, when I was a student teacher, we learned about Maslow and self-actualization and student center learning and stuff that you know we all expected was going to be a wonderful revolution. And, and 30 years later, I'm long gone from teaching, but now back at schools with my son, and I see that the Bush administration and the Bloomberg administration here in New York City have turned schools into great factories and uh, pure and simple. If you don't have the hard skills to spit out the grades as a six and seven year old, then you're worthless. And uh, how can we take these skills that we know are so important and so valuable, so intrinsically good for you, and convince? Joel Klein downtown, that, that that's what New York City is going to change. Well, that's, that's, I mean, I see this book, this book, the, these, these, you know, all the stuff that we're writing. Um, I see it as, as a campaign. I don't see it as a book, as a vehicle. I think it's a campaign. Study after study after study after study in this book show that if you promote these skills, it's not that children should learn content, children or should learn content. And children should go to school for ext extrinsic reasons as well as intrinsic reasons. But if you promote these skills, that the children will thrive on the standardized tests. We, we can get into a discussion about whether the standardized tests are good or not, whether the teachers the test stuff is good or not. You know, no, I don't think so. But but I don't know that we're going to rid the world of those that quickly. But what you find is if you if you parent and if you teach in different ways, you get the, you get better results on the measures that the, the saying that's you know that's the yardstick by which we're measuring our children you're going to get better better results from that and so here's an example um, this is a this is a readiness uh, a school readiness um, test that Megan McClellan uses the head to toe test so if the experimenter says touch your head the child is supposed to touch his or her toes touch your toes the child touches his or her head Okay, it's doing the opposite. It's like the day-night time and experiment. She found that she uses that as a predictor of school readiness in the University of Oregon, Oregon State. She found that the children who, who, who did better on that 
Simon says was the opposite game. Were the kids who had, had better uh, math and literacy and vocabulary scores? And if the, the greater their improvement on that simple little game, the greater the improvement on their standardized tests um, that they're using in pre-kindergarten pre and kindergarten and first grade. So I think that they're, we're going to get there, but through a different path. And in the meantime, how long are we going to turn off a generation of kids? How many, how many kids do we want who are dead on arrival when they talk about money? I don't, I don't know that. But also just to add real quickly, I think it's really interesting that in, in the book, Alan, you make clear that this strange divide between cognitive and social emotional doesn't actually really play out in the research on, on how our brains work, and that there are completely inter interconnected, and that these are actually cog these are cognitive skills as much as, as anything else. And that's actually a real, that's, that's going to be very hard for those of us in the education policy world to, in some ways because we kind of set up these columns in our charts in terms of what boxes we're going to check off that kids have. So um, it's, it's, another, it's another hurdle to overcome, but I think that there's some really good ways. Yeah, to and that's the, wonder, that's the wonder of the fact that people can now actually look at children's test scans and can look at what part of the brain is being activated when children do different tasks. Perspective taking is what um, the researcher who's done the most with fMRIs, um, uh, uh, Rebecca Sachs at MIT, calls a social cognition skill. I mean, I would also argue that it's emotional, but the part of the brain that deals with social and the part of the brain that deals with cognition, both are, are a play when children are learning to take perspectives. It's not empathy, uh, which one sees as just um, an emotional skill, it's, it's a social cognition skill. So I think we are we're probably at the, at the end here, we need to close down. I, I just want to say quickly, thank you very much, David, for inviting me.